Thank you very much, Wolf. Um, the economic, the financial crisis is long forgotten. Um, the euro is saved. Greece still exists. Uh, the European Union still exists with England in it, with Catalonia in it. So why on earth would you like to sit through a talk with such a title? Uh, let me find a pointer. Um, do you have a pointer? A laser pointer? Yeah. And this one is forward? Forward. Fine. Okay. Okay. Um, what I would like to do is to um, tell you or show you uh, or ask the question if, if you think of the hypothetical possibility that another financial crisis might happen in the future again, could we be prepared better than we have been for the last time, which cost us about uh, 15 trillion dollars, which is the equivalent of all Europeans working for a year for nothing. So can we do better? What I would like to do or what, what I would like to convince you is that systemic risk, the risk of a system to collapse, is a network property, and that if you want to manage systemic risk, you have to manage and reshape these networks. And I'll show you a way of how you, this can be done, could be done in financial networks, and uh, what consequences this has. I would also like to show you um, or discuss the question with you, can we predict the cost of a next financial crisis the co uh, in terms of um, euros per year? This is work done together with uh, Sebastian Politner, who works here at IASA. I have to thank the European taxpayer for paying most of this work. Before we start, I would like to share with you my view on what a complex system is. Um, if I have one slide, to tell you what it is, I show you this slide. Complex system is a co-evolving multiplex network. So what does that help you? Um, what, we, what you see here, this is, looks like a network. You have nodes, uh, nodes with different properties, nodes with different states that we will call sigma in the following. And these nodes are related or interacting with each other through interactions that can be of any possible type that you can think of. In physics, this would be the physical forces. In social systems, this would be contacts, communication, trading, whatever you can think of. In the context, we will talk about it. These nodes will be banks. Their properties will be how much capital do they have. Um, their state will be liquid or illiquid, or highly capitalized or, or out of the market, dead. Um, this is not a complex system yet. Um, to make it a complex system, let's keep in mind that these states are dynamic. They can change over time. Okay, if we specify a given network, and if we compute how uh, states of a system change as a function of these interactions, this is what we have been doing in physics for 300 years now. It's also not a complex system yet. So what does this make a complex system? It becomes complex if we allow the links, the interactions to be dynamical variables too, which change as a result of the states of the system. Okay, we have the situation that the states of the system change as a function of the topology of the interactions of the uh, system, and at the same time, the interactions change as a function of the states of the system. We have this chicken egg problem that we can mathematically no longer solve principle. I say the same thing that I told you now, what I think a complex system is in, in um, a cartoon equation. Um, it's the only equation in the talk. So the change of states, sigma, so the networks we call uh, the, um, the interaction network we call M. M-I-J is a matrix. Um, okay. So the change of states is somehow a function of the network and the initial state of the states. This is physics. 
And if you couple it to the possibility of changing the interaction topology as another function, whatever that is, that depends on the same things, on the, on the interaction topology initial state and the states of the system, then we have a complex system. This is an extremely rich, extremely complicated conceptually, uh, conceptual thing. The simplest physical realization of such a thing is general relativity, just for those of you who are interested. Uh, so in physics, such thinking already existed. Good, I will show you now um, that such a concept will be, is relevant. Uh, because we can, sorry, because we can observe all of these things for a financial system. We can observe the linkages, the, um, God. We can observe the links in the system and we can observe the states in the system. The links are financial contracts for the future of this talk and the, the, the states of the banks is their capital. Okay, let's jump into the question of systemic risk. What is systemic risk? There's, to make clear what systemic risk is, let's discuss what types of risks are there. There's economic risk. Economic risk is the risk that you have a business idea that does not fly. It costs something to produce the first prototype of a product that you invented. You ask your grandmother to finance it. You, you try to sell it, no one buys it. Your grandmother took the financial economic risk that your idea was bad, okay? That's economic risk. Credit default risk is the risk that people talk about mostly when they speak about banks. I lend you something, credit default risk is that I don't get it back. Um, and systemic risk is the risk that a, a system stops functioning, stops performing its function um, because some parts of it default and then this, this initially maybe small default can spread, percolate through the system, making it extremely costly in the financial context. Okay, so, um, yeah. So I've told you this. I've told you what credit default risk is. How do we manage credit default risk in our Western, or no, in our global world? Uh, you have heard the term Basel regulation, Basel type two, Basel two uh, regulation is how we manage this kind of risk. What is this? Banks have to keep a capital cushion for bad times. In case something happens, they have to have something on the side which they cannot touch for other investments. They have it in the basement. And um, yes. Um, and systemic risk is Definitely not the same as credit default risk. We'll, we'll discuss this a little bit. What banks and financial institutions care about nowadays is credit default risk, not systemic risk. Banks have no means to care about systemic risk. Even if they wanted to care about systemic risk, they could not. So to manage systemic risk must be um, on the side of a regulator. And I will tell you, you will see what I mean by that. Um, systemic risk can arise through two mechanisms. One is that agents synchronize the behavior. Everyone buys or sells at the same time uh, and uh, you have some herding effects which may involve some networks or, or not. What we want to focus on today is the origin of systemic risk that arises through networks of financial contracts. Okay? This we believe is very much manageable. It's just a technical uh, problem to solve. How, uh, the one and only intellectual point I'm making now on this slide, how does systemic risk spread? Systemic risk spreads by borrowing and not by lending. Credit default risk, the risk that I don't get something back is generated if I lend something. I generate risk for myself if I lend something to you. Systemic risk um, spreads by borrowing. It spreads the other way, the other direction. How is that so? Imagine I'm systemically risk-free. Um, if I collapse, if I go bankrupt, nothing happens to the world. 
if I borrow a million from Luis, for example, um, and he's perfectly well connected to the rest of the financial world, he's a systemic player, if he borrows something to me, if I borrow something from him, um, and if I now um, uh, face hard times, I, if I ca cannot pay him back, he might default as well, and then the, the, the disease really spreads. If I borrow from Dirk, for example, who is a rich guy, maybe, being a professor at ETH, <laughs> uh, um, 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 if I borrow from him a million, if, if, <laughs> he would not do it, but okay, imagine he would uh, give it to me. And if something happened to me, if the comet hits me, I cannot pay him back, um, then nothing happens. Dirk is mad at me, but that's it. Um, <laughs> uh, um, okay, so let's keep in mind, systemic risk spreads by borrowing and not by lending. It makes a difference from whom I borrow. Usually I don't care. If I get the million, I don't care from whom I get it, if it's just uh, for good conditions. Okay, and the last thing to, for preparatory remarks is systemic risk is not a single layer. It's not happening on a single layer of credits, for example. It also happens on other layers of financial uh, links that are possible between two, any two uh, financial players. So, so we could have uh, one layer of interbank credits, so the nodes are, again, banks. Think of banks or rich people. Um, here the links is credit, interbank credit. In another layer, it would be derivatives. On another layer, it would be whatever, cross holdings of portfolios or, uh, or, or liquidity networks. Whatever you can think of putting into a financial contrast, you will add uh, a new layer. Um, yes. How do we quantify systemic risk? That's a big question. Um, no, not many answers to it. Uh, what would be great if we could come up with a number, with a value for every financial institution in the world that tells us how systemically important it is. Remember that Google had the same problem 15, maybe 20 years ago. It wanted a number or a rank for every web, web page in the world that displays how relevant it is, how systemically relevant it is, important it is. And, um, and you know that Google came up with something like the page rank algorithm. What is page rank? A page, a web page is important if many important other pages point to it, have a hyperlink to it. So this is a, a famous page because some other famous pages are pointing to it. And this one is more or less famous because many small and not so important, but many pages point to it. Okay, so the page rank algorithm um, looks at the whole network to come up with, uh, with a measure of how important um, the page is. Now, let's do the same thing for systemic risk. An institution is systemically risky if systemically risky institutions lend to it. Okay, now we need this propagation um, method that we talked about before. So now the, the guys are not happy anymore. Now it's not about fame, it's about risk and danger. Um, this guy is dangerous because he has lent money from systemically uh, risky other guys. He has borrowed from, sorry, he has borrowed from systemically risky other guys. We don't call this uh, page rank anymore, we call it debt rank. It was developed by colleagues of Dirk at ETH. We have modified it a little bit to adapt it to our concrete problems. The basic idea is that you invent something that's very much uh, like a, a, a network centrality measure adapted to the specific problem of financial networks. Um, good. So. This debt rank now is a number that tells us what? It tells us what um, fraction 
of the entire economic value of a network, of a financial network, is affected if a certain node is kicked out of the system. If the node is destroyed by whatever reason. Okay, it's superior to other network centrality measures, but we don't discuss this here. Let me show you an example. It's actual data. Uh, here we see a couple of Austrian banks. So here's two banks that we're interested in. This is a mother bank, this is all the daughter banks. Um, the size of this node is the capitalization of the bank. How big is the bank? And um, the color of the bank is the systemic risk value, the debt rank. If it's red, it's very dangerous. If it's green, it's risk-free. So all the daughters are basically risk-free. They're not systemically relevant. Here we have two banks that are a little bit risky. Now, what I will show you on the next slide is this bank takes a credit from this one, a big one, a big credit, and see what happens to the debt rank, to the systemic uh, importance. So this guy gets extremely dangerous, even though it's small. This um, stops and ends the discussion of uh, um, too big to fail. It's not the case. A small institution can can be much more systemically relevant than a big one. Okay, so this is actual data from the Austrian interbank market. If we can do it for a couple of banks, let's do it for all Austrian banks. Here you see all institutions with a banking license in Austria, it's about a thousand uh, banks. Most of them don't play any role in, the, in systemic risk. A couple of them aligned on this circle here are systemically risky. And um, yeah, um, every line in this, in this graph is a credit or is a netted uh, um, portfolio of credits. Now let's take the most, 20 or 30 most uh, systemically relevant nodes in the, in the Austrian system and plot them here. This is the most risky bank to the left and this is this debt rank for this particular institution. Meaning if you kill this bank, 80% of the value in the financial system in, in, in Austria is affected, possibly lost or frozen for a long time. Um, and then you have a profile here that tells you country specific how risky your country is at a po given point in time. Good, you can do it for Austria, who cares? You can do it for every country that has information about their interbank markets, interbank networks. Mexico has a fantastic data set, records every financial transaction since 15 years. So we can compare the systemic risk of Mexico to the systemic risk of Austria. What do we observe? Mexico is much, much, much safer than Austria. So if you kill the most um, systemically relevant bank in Mexico, 30%, 35% of the total value in the Mexican market is affected. If you kill the most systemic bank in Austria, it's almost the entire system is affected. Okay, so we can do that uh, for a specific point in time. For Mexico, we can do that day by day. This is what? This is the integral of this curve. Oh, God. So we can integrate over these to get a feeling for the total risk in the system, we just sum up the, the, um, the individual contributions of each institution. And we get this uh, from 2007 to now, we see how systemic risk in a country is changing day by day, okay? Is this yet in dollars or euros? No, maybe we can do a little bit better. Um, we want to come from the notion of systemic risk to a number in euros per year. We want an expected loss. We want the cost, the expected cost for a financial crisis if it appears right now, okay? So um, um, we came up with this um, little formula here that the expected systemic loss of an individual bank is the probability of its default times its debt rank. And you can simply add up all over all banks of a country and this will be the expected systemic loss. This is not a trivial 
formula. This is the result of, an, of, a, of a combinatorial problem. But again, we won't discuss it here. But the end result of this is the cost of a crisis if, it is, if it's happening right now and if the government decides not to bail out anyone. That's all. So this is the result for Mexico since 2007 up to now, or to 2014. Please focus on the light gray curve. This is the cost uh, uh, for the crisis or in Mexico for the Mexican people if a crisis would occur. In uh, 100, billion, 100 millions of pesos uh, as indicated here. Okay? Note that before the crisis, total systemic risk costs were somewhere here. Right now, it's about a factor of five higher. If you tell, if the, we don't have it for Greece, but if you would tell this a Greek taxpayer or a Greek person that the expected cost for the crisis now, after the crisis, would be five times higher than it actually was up to now, then this would be, I think, a political bomb, knowing this. Okay, again, we could do this if we had data for every country, and then we could start comparing countries. We could measure if political interventions change actual systemic risk levels or not. Do we know if Spain and Portugal is now systemically uh, less risky than it was um, before all the painful inventions before? We don't know. This index, this new number, um, could help you uh, answer that question. Okay, that's what I said. Now, an experimental observation, a scientific finding by Sebastian, every transaction, however small, changes the total systemic risk value in your system. That's not obvious. Here we have the loan size. So we now just look at credits between banks. This is the credit between any two banks in one quarter of, of a year. And on the y-axis, you see the systemic risk increase for that transaction. Every point is a transaction. What do we observe here? So if we look for a credit of, of, of this size, this is multiplied with a random number that you don't that you cannot figure out which bank uh, is um, doing that transaction. Um, what you observe here is that for one type of transaction of this size, you find transactions that have this systemic risk increase or this systemic risk increase. And if you ask what is the difference between them, it's a factor 10,000. Okay, this is a big, big effect, one and the same financial transaction can cause 10,000 times more systemic risk than exactly the same transaction between um, not the same agents, but between different agents, okay? Every transaction causes systemic risk increase that you can measure, that central banks can measure at every millisecond if they want to. To compute these things, is, it's a trivial thing. Every cell phone can do this for you. Um, now, if systemic risk is a network property, then the management of systemic risk is to how to restructure a network that uh, systemic risk gets lower. Um, let's talk about it. Since systemic risk spreads by borrowing from risky agents, and since we know how risky a transaction is, we should restrict borrowing from systemically risky agents. We should re refrain from doing transactions that increase lots of systemic risk by a lot. So our proposal is let's tax every financial transaction by the amount of systemic risk that it introduces to the market. Okay, we do a, a smart transaction tax. If you transact a systemically risky transaction, people will try to look for another transaction and to evade the tax. So the motivation in life is tax evasion, as we know. So let's use this human um, um, need for 
tax evasion and let's tax risky uh, transactions and let's not tax risk-free ones. Good. Um, for the complexity aficionados among you, this introducing this tax, tax you want me to stop? One or two more minutes. Um, good. Um, and I, I will not tell you these things. Now, I've told you an idea. I've told you some experimental facts. I've told you an idea, how to test this idea. We have spent lots of millions from the European Union to build a simulator of the, fin uh, of the financial and real economy at the same time. It's a crisis simulator where we have, it's an agent-based model where we have uh, banking networks, firm networks, households, which are interacting in a more or less realistic way, in a more realistically big way. So it's millions of agents that we can simulate. We can simulate Austria. So what I'm showing you, what I should show you, if we implement our, we can gauge the model that it looks like Austria. And this is the, the risk profile that I've shown you. The red one here is the risk profile that, um, that we find in the model after making it uh, realistic. If we introduce our systemic risk tax, we see a dramatic drop of systemic risk of all financial institutions. This drop of systemic risk is enough that contagion does not happen anymore. I show you this on the final slide. So this is the risk increase in reality in the model. So you see this is very realistic. Here's the central plot. Um, this is the total losses to the system. The red curve, red and blue curves here show you the system when it's unregulated as it is now. You have a huge tail of losses, a fat tail, a power law in loss distributions. If we introduce the systemic risk tax, we are cutting off these risks. We are eliminating systemic risk. What is left, so there's still some risk left, this is economic risk, which we cannot get rid of. Okay? We will always have bad ideas and firms will go bankrupt. Um, this happen, th this works in the, in, the, in the model in a way that the trading volume, so the trading volume, the red one, is the unregulated system. The green one is with the tax. The trading volume does not change. If we introduce a Tobin tax, as is discussed right now in, in Europe, we can do it, we can make the system not much safer, a little bit safer, but we are affecting the transaction volume, the size of our credit, which is essential for our, our wealth, we would reduce this by a huge amount, okay? So systemic risk tax is just reordering, reshuffling, restructuring uh, financial networks in a way that reduces and eliminates systemic risk. It's a technical, I told you a technical, um, a technical story technical problem that can be solved if you want. And uh, I guess I leave it with this and um, thank you for your attention.